The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. The Bible is a spiritual book and nothing like it in your library. Nothing like it in your library. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Um, can't study it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or vert sins. How do you get out of carnality into spirituality? Because the Holy Spirit lives inside your body. Your body is the temple of God. First Corinthians uh, tells us that. How do we get out of carnality and back into spirituality? First John 1 John 1.9 says, confess your sin. You got to do a self-examination because you're a believer priest in the church age. You're a believer priest. You have to do all this within your own. The Holy Spirit will convict, but you have to confess. First John 9, 1 John 1.9 says, if you confess your sins, here's what God promises you. He is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. Cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Not just your sin, but the unrighteousness associated with it. That's quite a deal. So I give you this moment of silence. Do your own self-examination. If you're a believer, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day, that's called the gospel if you believe it. The gospel has the power to save you, and this is who I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with believers tonight who have a desire to know the word of God. So take a moment in 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9. Every church-age believer is a priest responsible for his confession of sin. Well, our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way by automobile and internet to study with us. We've closed out one big study on the angelic conflict, and we're going to continue our study from Tuesday night to Wednesday night in dealing with the transition of doctrines from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant based on the completed work of Christ on the cross as every gospel of the New Testament, every gospel closes with this enormous thing that Christ died, was buried, and raised from the dead. And so, Father, we, we thank you for our study tonight. We pray for the people uh, that are in the path of this uh, hurricane. Uh, it may sweep a large place, so we're going to talk about the East Coast in our prayer and pray, Father, that people would be smart. I mean, you know, there's a, there's, they just need to be smart about taking care of themselves. They don't need to wait this one out. And so I pray they would be smart about life. And we pray, Father, for great ministry to come out of it. I know our people up there are always excited about it, being able to, to reach people that sometimes they won't let you in the house, but they will when their house is gone. And uh, they open their houses up to them, and great ministry comes out of something as unique as that. So we pray for that. Pray, Father, for the Holy Spirit to minister truth tonight of the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so we're merging our Tuesday and our Wednesday studies to get through the final of chapter 10, and then we'll talk about where we're going from there. So if you have your Bibles, open them to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. If you didn't, if you didn't bring a Bible or a cell phone that has it, then it's on the top of your paper. And I want to show you a couple things that are kind of important about these two verses. It says, therefore, brethren, and we, we studied last night this same passage. The word therefore is always why for. Why for is therefore. And it goes back to 17 and 18. And, of course, even farther, that could go back as far as chapters 8, 9, and 10. But... Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, last night we studied that the holy place in reference here is the third heaven where Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. 
we know that because of the ninth chapter, verse 24, that says it. It's not an opinion. It says it. Therefore, brother, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, the third heaven, by the blood of Jesus, only way you go to heaven is through the blood of Jesus and through his flesh, you'll see in a moment. By his blood, notice the word by, by his blood, by a new and living way. Remember, he introduced this. We, we talked about this. Last. He introduced this idea at the Last Supper. John 13 through 17, he introduced this idea. He did it this way. A lot of people don't realize, but John 14, 6, the Last Supper idea. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. That's what he's talking about. And the writer of Hebrews picked that up and went into a whole theological dissertation on it called the doctrine. And so, therefore, brethren, since we have confidence in the holy place, the third heaven, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord for a believer when he dies, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. But remember that word way in the Greek language, Greek language is hodas. And I said there was a movie. That, uh, a TV program that used to be on called Highway to Heaven. Remember that? Uh, well, this is where that idea would come from. This would be a way that an idea like that, how could you highway to heaven? This is actually what this is talking about. Because of the word way is the word hodas, meaning road or in our day, highway. Um, it, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated, Notice that's a compound word. The word E-G actually is a preposition N. Uh, E-G, kinazo, is a word new. Therefore, it's an aorist active indicative, and it means to make a new, a new way or a new highway to heaven. And we talked about that last night. We talked about how when the Old, when the old, Cust, uh, um, old Testament believers died, they went to Sheol to await their order of the resurrection. But not us. When we die, we go to be to, with Christ, at, at, who is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And we, we learned from Ephesians 2, 5, and 6 last night that the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are seated with Christ in the heavens already, positionally, in Christ. You know, 2 Corinthians 5. If any man be in Christ... He's a new creature, creature, a new creation. When you, Christ goes to the cross and dies for your sin, not only yours, but the sin of the entire world. First John, we go to First John 2, 1 and 2. His propitiation works not only for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. He, he's buried for three days, he's buried and raised from the dead on the third day. That is called the gospel in 1 Corinthians 3 and 4. When you believe that, Romans 1, 16, the gospel is the power of God to save, to er, save everyone who believes. The gospel, that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead to give you eternal life. The moment you believe it, you have it. The gospel is the power of God to save you. You don't have the power to save yourself. Nobody else has the power to save you other than Jesus Christ. And it's the gospel that you believe that saves you. And the moment you believe the gospel, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. Not only, and that's 2 Corinthians 5.17, and you become a new creation, a new creature in Christ. Galatians, the third chapter, verse 27 says, or maybe it's for verse 38, that you are in, that you, you bab, baptized into Christ. Baptized into Christ. And not only that is true with your salvation, the package of 50 things you receive in salvation, you can never lose in time and eternity. Not only that, not only are you in Christ, we call it positional sanctification. Not only are you in Christ forever, positionally, but you are seated, you are seated with him, positionally. That's, listen, that's Ephesians 2, 5, and 6. 
Now, either you know that or you don't care to know it because you didn't write it down. Okay? This is class. This is this called class. It's not school. It's class. And, you know, if you have class, you do some of it. Unless you've got a, a, an, an enormous mind, and I'll tell you, so, at some point, you're going to want to remember what I taught you because God brought you here. God brought you here. I don't care what else you think got you here. God brought you here, and whatever is going to be said here tonight is going to be important to your life. It may not be right now. Well, anyhow. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, the third heaven by the blood of Christ, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us, for whom? Man, why does Christ go to the cross? Why does he go back? This is for us. He didn't do this for himself. He did it for us. For us. Through the veil, that is his flesh. So you got two things here. You got two things that are really important to the Christian church. In the Eucharist, what some people call the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. You got the body of Christ, the bread, and you got the cup of Christ, the blood. And that's what the gospel is all about. <clears throat> and there it is. The veil. Now, the veil is important because the veil he's talking about here, because of the subject matter of chapter 8, 9, and 10, is connected to the veil of the temple. The, everything about the Old Testament tabernacle temple was shadow Christology. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 1. Everything is shadow Christology. In other words, it was pointing towards the coming of Christ. And the writer of, of Hebrews really goes into great detail on that subject matter. Okay? So we're going to talk about the new covenant doctrine of the veil. The, the, the new covenant doctrine of the veil is totally different than the Old Testament study of the veil. Because that was a shadow of something to come, and what was to come was Christ being the perfect sacrifice for our sins in order to bring us to God to take us to heaven when we die. Now, the Christian life is not just about the fact that you got a big, a good deal after you die. Listen, it's about you got a good deal while you're living. Okay, so once again, the writer of Hebrews is emphasizing the superiority of the doctrines of the new covenant over the old covenant. This time, it involves, it involves a veil system. A veil system. A whole system of theology. <clears throat> okay, and it involved the temple or tabernacle of the old covenant, which was shadow Christology. Everything about it was shadow Christology. And the writer brings out how important the veil. Now, the veil that they're talking about with the tabernacle involves the system, the theological system, involved, involved a first veil and a second veil. The first veil was to the holy place, and the second veil was to the holies of holies. The holy, <laughs> the holies of holies, okay? The holies of holies. They each had a veil. Here's a veil and here's a veil. And we'll talk about that. And there was a whole theology involved in this. They, this whole deal was limited only certain people could enter either of these two places that had veils 
only certain people. Not every, not, not every believer could do this. And so it was a limited system. And it is not a limited system in the, under the new covenant. And that's the change. The theology is magnificent. So here's my first point. The old covenant veil system taught that Adam's original sin, the sinfulness of man, separated sinful man from a, a holy God. Adam's sin. Adam's sin. Like Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, well, wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death spread to all mankind. That's how that works. Okay, Romans, the fifth chapter. The Old Testament system, uh, the veil system of the Old Testament, taught this very principle in shadow Christology. You got a whole bunch of believers in the Jewish age. In the Jewish age, you got a whole bunch of believers. They couldn't, they could not, they didn't have access here. It was off limits. The only people that could go into the holy place were the priest. The old covenant priest. The only person that could go into the second was the high priest, and he could go only once a year. Day of atonement. Everybody else had no access. It was limited. They didn't have access. You can walk in there. You can walk into either one of those rooms. Now, you're going to die. You're going to die if you did. You were not permitted in there, and you better not go in there. And so that was the old covenant system. This here, the, the priest could go into this place. A, a priest like John, John, Zachariah, John the Baptist's dad, he went, that's where he went. Only the high priest could go in the holies of holies, on the Day of Atonement, this is where the Ark of the Covenant, this is where the blood was put. This was the whole bit. This was the, the big deal. Th this represented the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The rest of it taught about the preparation of a priesthood. See, here's, this is, whole thing is about a priesthood. This whole thing is about a priesthood. And it was a limited priesthood. Please tell me you know that. You had to be a Levi. A tribe of Levi. Jesus Christ himself couldn't go in there. He, wasn't, he was from the tribe of Judah. He, 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 was, he was his as a throne. The writer of Hebrews tells you that in chapters 8, 9, and 10. Okay? Himself he couldn't. But when he went to the cross, he, he took care of all this. We do not live in this system. We have a completely different system. Because Christ came to bring all that into fulfillment and to bring it into a different place or a different order. That's so good. And this whole system was set up to show that man is in need of a savior. And it requires his blood and his body. And if his body's not right, his blood won't. He's born the son of God in Luke 1, 34, 35. He comes by virgin birth. His father is not Joseph. His father is God. His bloodline is off from God, not man. So he has to be virgin born. He has to be virgin born. He has to be a lamb of God without blemish and spot. Blemish is no birth defects. Spot is no growth defects. That deals with impeccability. He must live 30, 33 years before going to the cross. His entire life has to be lived volitionally without sin. Like Adam and Eve, he cannot sin. Like they did. He cannot sin. He could sin volitionally. He could go against the plan and will of God. But he didn't. 
Because 2 Corinthians 5, 20, he who knew no sin became sin for us. That's, that's 2 Corinthians 5, 21, which the writer of Hebrews talks about in the fourth chapter, 14 and 15. All of that is that this is the shadow of what we embrace as the reality of it. We, we embrace the substance of the shadow because that's Christ in his first coming. Under the old covenant veil system, only the Leviticus priest could enter the holy place and only the high priest of Aaron could enter the holies of holies. In Hebrews 9, 6 through 8, which we've already studied, I bring to your remembrance. Now, when these things have, have been prepared, the priest is talking about the sac sacrifices of shadow Christology. The priests are continually entering the outer, or maybe your Bible says first, because it's actually the word first. The priests are continually entering the outer or the first tabernacle, performing the divine worship. That's behind veil one what he's talking about into the second through the second veil into the second, which they call uh, uh, the wor worship place of the tabernacle as far as sacrifice for sin, but into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without blood can't enter it without blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of his of the people committed in ignorance. Now he tells you what this means to you and I in the church age. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the first outer tabernacle is still standing. Okay? And we know what he's talking about this whole system was designed to take you to heaven through Jesus Christ. The whole, the whole system was designed to take you to heaven through Jesus Christ. Listen, you're not going to get there apart from faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't care what religion you're in nor what denomination you're in. This is pure, simple stuff here. It's not complicated. I mean, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, qualifies to go to the cross. And not only that, he has to finish it. So one of the key words that he says from the cross at the end of his suffering is that it is finished. Except it had more impact to the plan of God than you could imagine because when he did, he wrapped up all of redemption as completed. Therefore, in Hebrews 9.12, the writer calls it eternal redemption. They didn't have it in the Old Testament. They had to wait till Christ would come and give it to them. It was a promise. So what's the point, Ron? Well, the point is to tell you what you take ho-hum, if I say ho-hum, you know what I mean? Ho-hum. I could take it and leave it. I could take it or leave it. I mean, that's an attitude of Christians. I could take it or leave it. You understand the cost to get? So you have that ho-hum attitude. Do you understand that you enter into an eternal redemption nobody else had? Nobody in the Old Testament had it. I don't care who you pick and bring up. Well, let me call to... The stand, Abraham. Nope, he didn't have. How about David? Nope. How about, no, 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 nobody. Okay. Well, I got the proof text for you. Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. It's exactly what he does. Book of Hebrews. Book of Hebrews. You know, I get accused a lot of being dogmatic. You're better off in my shoes than yours. Because I'm telling you what I believe to be the promises of God and backed it up with Scripture. 
all you've got is feeling. I hear people go, well, I'll get saved when I want to. Oh, I'll get saved when I'm ready. Oh, I'll get saved one day. I, and based on, based on how long, look, how long do you think you have to live? Well, I think, yeah, I know. You got 120 years. Are you prepared to live it? Man, I hear people say, whether well, you're 16, they want to, you want to live a long way as a rule. But when you get up into 70 or 80 and health issues, then you go like, hey, I'm changing my mind. I, I want a shorter deal here. I was looking for 120 years, but I think I'll shorten this thing up. And then we start negotiating, making deals. That the people talk that kind of foolishness both in their life, but they talk that way about being saved. Well, I'll take my chances. What are we talking about? Here, here's a gun. Let's put a bullet in it, spin it, and let's... You know, they called it Russian roulette. But you're doing it with your soul. Why would you do that? Well, I think I'm a good person. I've been in church. I've, I, I read the Bible once in a while. I mean, I honor the Christmas holiday. I, I'm a pretty decent guy. I, here, and here's the one that always gets me. You know, I, I live a lot better than a lot of the people who go to church. <laughs> I can believe that. I can believe that. I can believe that in my own life. If you're a pure, purest moralist, you outlive, you're, you live better than me. We're not going to compare our two lives. Listen, you don't compare your life to mine. You don't compare your life to anybody else. You know who compared it? Jesus Christ. Put your life up against him. Better than somebody. You got to be better than Jesus not to accept him. You got to be better than Jesus. I don't, any, I don't know any fool that's read the life of Christ would ever set himself up for that kind of a deal. You know, as the old saying goes, I got a couple bridges you could buy. <laughs> a couple bridges. Listen, you can't do that. What's wrong with you? You know, I love, Paul says, I'll tell you what, when you hear the gospel, today is the day of salvation. And why are you putting it off? I put it off for a year. I put it off for a year. I heard it just as clear as a bell. And I knew. I knew in my heart I ought to get saved. I didn't know what that meant. But I did know this. Because the, the guy that led it to me told me, if you don't believe it, you're going to go to hell. And I went, cha-ching. And so I spent a year not getting saved because I thought there was a deal on the backside of it. You know, they give it to you, the big print, and take it away in the small. I didn't trust anybody. Especially those in the church that kept asking me for stuff. Why would you keep asking for me when I have a need? I need to be saved, and you want my billfold. I don't understand that. See, that's the last thing we want from you. We want you to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. That's the best deal in town. You'll never find a better deal than that. Not in a million years. Now, he'll move the furniture in your life. <laughs> he'll definitely move the furniture in your life. But it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. He moved a lot of furniture in my life. Listen to what this says. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, listen to this. Now, I put it on your paper because I want you to put your eyes on it. Because sometimes you can see what you can't hear. Listen to what he says. God, he, God, made him Jesus Christ, his son. God made his son, watch this now, who knew no sin. He, that, that means personal. To be sin, look, God took his only begotten son. This is how big a deal salvation is that you, you think you don't have to have right now. I'll do it later. I'll do it this. I'll do it that. There is no later. Paul said today is the day of salvation. In fact, he used a great word. He said, behold, today. Listen. God took his only begotten son and made him to be sin. Watch this now. 
On whose behalf? On our behalf. And you think you're going to go some other way than through Jesus Christ to God when he's made it the only way? You think there's going to be another way? Do not listen to the devil lie to you. You listen to the word of God. Now listen, God made his only begotten son who knew no sin for 33 years to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, God takes your sin through Christ and gives you Christ to righteousness. Do you think that's not, listen, without righteousness, no man sees God. Without righteousness, no man sees God. And I'm not talking about self-righteousness. I'm not talking about good work righteousness. I'm talking about the work of Christ on the cross where he took our sins and gave us his righteousness as a gift. We have the greatest message in the whole wide world. John Dyer called me today just excited, celebrating the birth of another into the kingdom. Teenager out of Moody. No, no. Oh, I wish it was Pat. That's his sister. Boy, you pray for John Dyer's sister. She's, she's up in age, and she still resists believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray for John's sister, Pat. But a young guy got saved today. John called me and said, got a, got a birthday. Let's celebrate. Got a birthday. I said, how I love the... How I love that. He who, he who knew no sin was made sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. You know what that is? We call that in theology impeccable. Listen, his blood has to be impeccable and his body has to be impeccable to be the sacrifice for sin. And when he says it's finished, it was. Jeez. What are you dragging your feet on? What are you dragging your feet? Listen to this. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. I put them in bold print for some time. You need to read it. He said, the blood of Christ is the redemptive price. He calls it the precious blood of the lamb. He calls it precious blood. God calls the blood of Christ offered as a sacrifice for our sins precious. Now, I don't know how you, how you refer to it. But that's how God refers to it, as precious. He calls it precious because the blood of Christ is unblemished and spotless. That's 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19. In 1 Peter, same book, 2 chapter, verse 24, he says that Christ bore our sins on his body on the cross. Now it's time for us to die to sin and to live for Christ. And, that, and that, how about that? Now it's time for us to die to sin and to live for Christ. Die for sin means die for that selfish lust gratification in your life that you know is sin. How about dying? How do I die to it? I submit myself to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 16, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. You will not. It doesn't say maybe. It says you will not. But you got to walk in the Spirit. That's a choice. That's a command, by the way. Here, here's the third chapter, same book, 1 Peter. Here's the third chapter, verse 18. He says he's died for sins once for all. Now, the writer of Hebrew tells you that a hundred times, I guess. Peter picks it up and says that he dies for sin once for all. For what reason? To bring us to God. To bring us to God. The just for the unjust. He says, Christ took death in the flesh. 
and God gave him life in the spirit. Death in the flesh, life in the spirit. It's well worth a read. Of course, one of the most famous verses is John 1, 29. Behold the Lamb of God, John the Baptist says. Behold the Lamb of God that's come to take away what? Sin of the world. Sin of the world. And you know why that's important? Because of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever would believe in him would step out of perishing and into eternal life. How about that? When he does what? When he believes. That's, that's the key word in the gospel of John. Believe. And you know what? You know what John's talking about? The prophecy of Isaiah 53. Just the same thing as Paul was in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. When he said that Christ died for his sins according to the scriptures. What's he talking about? Was buried and raised from the dead. Was he talking about Christ died according to the He says according to the scripture. It wasn't no New Testament. He's talking about Old Testament. He's talking about Isaiah 52 and 53. Yeah, you know a key word how you know you're kind of doing well in your Christian life? Order. There's order in your life as opposed to what? Chaos. Chaos is a word the devil pushes. Chaos. Order. And I'm talking about spiritual order. I mean, how, you want a thermometer or how well you're doing? Check that one out. Because in 1 Corinthians, when he's talking about spiritual gifts in chapter 12, 13, and 14, and 14, he says God is a God of order. And th listen, the one thing a church ought to have is order. We, we exemplify it. And that's what he was talking about to the Corinthians. The Corinthians. And they were allowing spiritual gifts. They were allowing spiritual service to become, dis to become dysfunctional. Isn't that crazy? I mean, this crazy. You shut that down and have prayer meeting, don't we? How about that? If you don't like what's going on, how about assembly and have prayer? If you can pray and not, not shout at each other. Huh? How about that? Here's one. 1 John 2. 2 and 12. Verse 2 says, for he himself, when you see that phrase, it means he alone. He himself, no one else does. He himself, that's who died on the cross. You know, you do know that, don't you? How do I know it? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He himself became the propitiation for our sins. He alone, he hung on the cross alone. When he took on our sins, alone. You have never been alone as he was alone. There will never be a day in your life like that. Never, because it was the biggest day in his life. Because he took the worst day that you could ever experience. He gave you every good day that you should experience. Don't be talking about, no, I'm having a bad day. Bad day. It's a bad day. Depends on what you compare it to, right? Bad day. Bad day. Well, he himself is the propitiation. In other words, he appeases the wrath to God in his judgment. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, the judgment of our sins, and not ours only, but also those of the whole world. Right? Now, here's what you're missing. Not only ours is limited. People that say, well, he only died for our sins, that's limited atonement. The writer says that's not true. The writer says that is not true. Listen to what he says. Not for ours only, but also for those of the whole what? 
world. That's unlimited atonement. This is absolute foolishness. This is absolute foolishness not to see that. He didn't die just for those who got saved. He died for everybody that could be saved. That's what the writer's talking about. What did he do? He hung on the cross, the propitiation, the sacrifice for the judgment of sin. And he died for everyone who believed. Died for just some. What kind of foolishness is that? Jeez. Verse 12. I don't know why I'm all fired up tonight. I have no idea, but I am sure fired up tonight about something. Listen, verse 12. He says, your sin, uh, this is a wonderful, Johnny. This is a great verse here. Your sins have been forgiven you for his namesake. Now, Johnny, here's the big one. This word forgiven is in the perfect tense. It's a perfect tense. Passive indicative. You know what the perfect? T tell me, class, what's perfect tense mean? That's right. It was completed in the past, and it remains completed forever. Your sins, when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, your sins are in the perfect tense. Because Christ died one death to complete the whole deal. And when you believe that, you enter that eternal redemption. And you get, by the grace of God, not by works, you get, by the grace of God, the perfect tense of forgiveness. Which means you, your sins are forgiven by God from now forever. Wow, is that not? And the passive voice is a voice of grace. And how did that occur for me, Ron? How did that happen? The grace of God through the propitious work of Christ on the cross. When he who knew no sin became sin for you, I wrote this in the book for you. Give them forgiveness. Give them forgiveness in the perfect tense because that's what my son did in his death. That Listen. The perfect tense is a way that God honors the work of Christ on our behalf. And it's a great tense in the Greek language. And it's used a lot with salvation. Point four. At the ninth hour on the cross, the Bible says, at the ninth hour, while Christ was hung on the cross, the old covenant veil system became obsolete, growing old, and ready to disappear out of Hebrews 8.13. Here it is, Matthew 27.44. Matthew 27.44 on your paper. From the sixth hour, which is noon, darkness fell upon all of the land until the ninth hour. Do you know how unusual that is? From 12 to noon is the high is high noon, isn't it? I mean, I mean, if you watch the television, they'll say, oh, it's going to be hot between 12 by 3. Then it'll cool down, right? Sun goes down. Listen, the sun went down when it's supposed to be, be at its peak. It went down. In other words, darkness covered the earth from noon to 3. Well, Christ paid the propitious judgment death. Nobody looked on him. It was so dark you couldn't see a hand in front of you. At the ninth hour, 3 p.m., Christ uttered these words. Christ uttered these words. 
Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit, right? It, 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 he says, Father, it is finished, right? He says, Father, it's finished. And he, he yields up the, his spirit. And look what happens. Two things happen. Two things happen that nobody even knows about. The one they know about, probably not the second. But here's the important of my lesson tonight. The veil of the temple right there. Now watch. Don't tell me just ripped because that's not what he said. There, that's it, right? Let's go the way it was done. You got this, got this thing here, blocks it all out, and he tears it from top to bottom. You know what he does? Opens it up. You ever been to a movie screen? Got there early? Shut. Then you get really excited when they go, <laughs> open up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We see when he tore it from top to bottom, you have one side over here and one side over here, which means it's what? Open. Well, there you go. Thank you, William. That was a weird story. Oh, there. Jeez. I guess that shows you how long I've been to a movie theater, I guess. I thought I would add that to uh, Well, thank you. <laughs> Listen, from top to bottom, the earth, well, here's the second thing. The earth shook, the rocks were split, the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tomb after his resurrection, they entered the Holy See and appeared to many. I often think about that rich man who said, send somebody to my brothers. Maybe that happened, huh? And here's my final point. Every church age, every church age believer has access. Now, here we are. Bring it, I'm bringing it home, Robert. I'm bringing it home right here. I'm bringing it in right here's what's important. Every church age believer priest has access into the presence of God from the moment of salvation forever. You know why? <laughs> open right there, open. Every church age believer has access into the presence of God. From the moment of grace, salvation, forever. Do you know how wonderful that is? Nobody had that in the Old Testament. Every believer is a priest in this. First Peter 2, 5 and 9. Every believer is a priest. And every believer priest has access into the presence of God himself. Because Jesus made it possible. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. I mean... Nobody, nobody could do that in the Old Testament. You had to be part of the priest family, and you had to be part of the high priest family to even get there. The least in the kingdom has access to what only the high priest had in the Old Testament. The least in the kingdom, Bubba. I don't know who the least is. But I know the least in the kingdom. That's probably me. I don't know. Never thought about it until just now. Listen. Listen to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 18 and 19. For through him, we both, whether Jew or Gentile, have our access in one spirit, Holy Spirit, to the Father, so that you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are now fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Every church age believer is a priest and has access into the presence of God 
every moment of every day of every year of his life. Do you take advantage of that? Do you know how what a privilege that is to do that? You, you, do you understand the, how important it is to look? Here it is, Hebrews four sixteen. Let me show you four four sixteen. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Watch this now. This is because we have access, so that we may receive mercy and find help. And find grace to help in time of need. Do you realize what a privilege that is? Every one of us in this room that believe the gospel of Jesus Christ have access to this. <laughs> because Christ made the way possible, didn't he? We should be so thankful. I mean, just that s the fact that we can hit our knees and know that we've hit the throne and we know we get what we ask. That's a pretty powerful thing, don't you think? And listen, you got the ear of God. You're not going through some chain of command. <laughs> You're not going through some chain of command. You have direct access. You know why? Because in Christ, you are a beloved son. And he is your Abba Father. Let us pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed to give you a moment of silence with yourself. Look, don't put this thing off anymore. Number one, believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't believe it because Ron Adema says it. Believe it because the Bible says it. It's the only book in your library that you can find in heaven. The only book. Because the Bible keeps telling us everything going on, on earth has come out of the pattern of the eternal book. This is just a copy of it that I hold in my hand. Leave the Bible. Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. Believe it. Tell the Father you believe. I believe that Christ died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead. That's how easy it is to be saved. All the work, all the difficulty was done by Jesus Christ, dying, dying the propitious death for us so that we can be saved by grace. And for those of us that are there, do we understand the importance of what has been purchased for us under the new covenant? We're new covenant people. Oh, my goodness. Father, I thank you tonight for these that have come our way to study with us and made this study just ring within our souls the truth of the superiority of the doctrines of the new covenant over the old. And how important they all are to us. How significantly the death of Christ and looking at the details of it. Where the veil of the temple, because his veil dies, opens the veil unto the new covenant. What an enormous idea. Thank you, Father. Encourage our hearts. We have the message that the world needs to hear. And listen, there are a lot of guys like me out there that want to hear it. They don't know it, but they want to. And when they hear it, their life will be changed when they believe forever. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.